What's up, everyone? Welcome back for another episode of Questions You Never Thought to Ask, the Whitewater Kayaking Podcast. My name is Seth Ashworth. And before we get started, I would just like to say a big shout out. Thank you to the people who support this page on Patreon. Patreon is a crowdfunding platform where you can chip in a couple of dollars a month just to kind of keep this keep this going, keep the lights turned on. And in exchange, you get to hear the podcast before it comes out, sometimes as much as a few weeks before it comes out, sometimes just a week before it comes out, depending on my how good I am at uh, making it happen. If you want to support that way, you obviously can through Patreon. It's uh, patreon.com slash Seth Ashworth. That address again, Patreon dot com slash seth ashworth yeah episode 37 here with sal montgomery who is a kayaker uh, explorer television personality i think you're gonna really enjoy uh, i really enjoyed this discussion so yeah enjoy all right welcome back to questions you ever thought to ask the whitewater kayaking podcast this week i'm joined with a tv personality pro kayaker uh, all the way from the uk sal montgomery um, Sal, I would be doing you a total disservice if I tried to give your introduction. So would you like to tell everyone, um, in not too many words, a bit about yourself? <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel pretty complimented after that intro. That was pretty nice, I think. Uh, so yeah, my name is Sal. I'm from the UK. Um, as you can tell, I'm pretty squeaky. Um, and I have kayaks a lot of places around the world really um and just really enjoy getting out there having adventures um and just exploring really um it's taken me to some really cool places and a lot of people um from the uk will know you from your kind of tv expeditions with um steve backshaw um and for people who are in the kind of like north america audience who are not don't see that you've been on a couple of these like bbc television programs where you're kind of facilitating Steve Backshaw's ex- expeditions, basically. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah. Um, so um, I literally just um, a week or so ago came back from Russia um, on a, a pretty big first descent, um, which was special for a crazy amount of reasons. Um, I can mention it a little bit, but not go into like super specific details at the moment. But um, just the fact that we were able to get out there at the moment with everything that's going on, uh, we were all like hugely appreciative of. Um, but yeah. Um, and been... Without getting into that one too much, because mm-hmm. I'm sure yeah. you're under <laughs> the contract or whatever. But mm-hmm. uh, I know you guys were in Kamchatka Peninsula, which is um, the little spit off the edge of Russia where yeah. there's more... Um, there's meant to be like more salmon and more grizzly bears per capita than any other region in the world, I think. Yeah, um, it's if I'm correct, which I think I am, uh, it's the highest population of bears in the world, I believe. Um, and that certainly seemed true whilst we were there. Um, it's by far the most remote place I've ever been to. Um, and it was just incredible. Um, to see that such wild places still exist in the world is just really, really special to see um and yeah i've gained a huge amount from this expedition um even just off the river um the experience was just amazing well that's quite a quite a teaser for yeah. uh, for that <laughs> TV show at some point in the future that i hope we'll be able to see in north america but let's uh let's talk about the last one you did with steve backshaw that was in um uh kingdom of bhutan yeah yeah um, so, now i talked uh, about this when we had um james pringle bedminton on a few uh, episodes ago um but do you want to give us the lowdown what were you doing in bhutan like what was the goal uh and then there's a couple other bits i want to dig into in that okay okay cool um so if like me you weren't very familiar with where bhutan is in the world um it's a, a tiny little country a landlocked country between china and india so in the eastern himalayas in south asia um and we were there to basically explore the last unrun river in Bhutan so the only river that had never been paddled before um, it it became our kind of challenge to go and explore it and see what was going on Um, the reason it hadn't been explored previously is because the locals all believed that it dropped off the face of the world (laughs) which at times it felt a little bit like it was Um, but actually in amongst all of that was some amazing white water and just an absolutely stunning place Um, 
this was my first expedition with Steve, um, who most people will know. He's a, a wild, a wildlife uh, nature expert and TV presenter. Yeah, I think uh, like so if if we were to get a compare him for someone, he's like kind of like a crocodile Dundee type, person, <laughs> but like but from England, and they're like a little bit more middle of the road. Yeah, he's um, most well known for a program that's really popular over here in the UK called Deadly 60, uh, which I think is aimed at kids. But um, I'm starting to find that a lot of adults are super into it, too. Um, I personally, um, I wasn't familiar with Steve prior to the expeditions because um, I don't actually own a TV. So I'm, I'm not super, um, super in touch with what's going on programs wise and stuff. Um, but I soon learned that he's. Uh, very popular and well known for all the amazing stuff that he does um, and he's been kayaking from a pretty young age he started in the scouts but doesn't necessarily get to do it super often um, and he also does a lot of other sports for his um, his kind of tv shows and things really into climbing uh, very into diving because obviously that can take him into some really um, kind of uh, lesser known areas um, and kayaking is one of those things that he perhaps um doesn't get to do it very often but the kayaking he does do is pretty spectacular and um, he's done some really impressive expeditions all around the world um but because it's not something he's doing that often he needs kind of a team with him and um, that can kind of guide him down and advise him as we go and things so it's um yeah a real team effort and, and in the build up to a trip like that uh, how much like pre-training did you have to do with steve to kind of get him like to a paddling level where you guys were happy to be like, okay, you got this. Well, Bhutan was quite an interesting one, really, because um, that was the ninth episode of a 10 part series. And he was literally doing back to back expeditions, literally like being in the country for a couple of days before flying out to the next place. Um, also, whilst building a house and having his first child. Um, and he I, has a lot of things on the go then yeah it was a crazy crazy year for him um, and I only actually met him once prior to the expedition so we got to do very little prepara preparation um, and that could possibly be um, evident um, from uh, from the program there was a little bit of a near miss um, a bit of um, a day where we had some difficulties so we learned a lot from that expedition um, and for the most recent one to Russia, we basically dedicated the whole summer to getting ourselves ready for that trip. Um, and obviously we couldn't really travel because um, everything that's going on in the crazy world right now. Um, but we used every spare moment we had to train wherever possible in the UK. Um, we were using white water courses, any rivers that had water in. And there was even some days where the rivers were so empty that we ended up just taking our boats out and surfing one foot waves just trying to have more time in our kayaks before heading out um, and we also did a good amount of safety and rescue training and on just trips like, like that oh. i know it's it's from the tv it looks like it's just like you know you and pringle and steve and uh, whoever other else is kayaking oh. with you and it seems like so like yeah you're just cruising down the river or whatever <laughs> but i know from my experience of working those things there's always like a, a lot more people with you than than ever you see and that, that also like the amount of equipment and and travel weight that you have suddenly like exponentially increases as soon as anyone says the word like film um <laughs> how much how many extra people were with you that you had to kind of manage and deal with and what were some of the struggles that you had with like all those extra uh you know extra gear weight extra things extra extra stuff going on yeah um you've completely hit the nail on the head there it's it's a really strange experience watching a program back, which is maybe 50 minutes long. And that's summing up a, like a three week expedition. It's crazy. Um, but yes, as you will know, any um, any adventure or expedition which is being documented, um, there is a huge amount of extra work that's going on behind the kayaking, during the kayaking and even afterwards um, every day you have to allow for a huge amount of film faff. Um, many days we were getting on the water later than planned because we'd had to do so much preparation um, and getting everyone ready, all the equipment and things. And because of that, we were getting off the water really late. Um, 
and how, how many people were with you like how many people were in your kind of core kayakers crew and then how many extra video crew were with you in particular for bhutan or russia yeah, yeah. in particular for bhutan because I'm, I'm trying for not bhutan, to talk but... about russia too much okay so <laughs> oh thank you <laughs> i appreciate that uh so bhutan uh, on the water there was as you know myself um as a safety kayaker um, Pringle, who is also a safety kayaker, but also kind of on the water cameraman. Steve, who was the presenter, um, as well as a kayaker, obviously. Um, Daz, or Darren Clarkson King, who was the expedition leader. Um, I think he's he... like episode uh, 10 of this podcast, maybe, or episode 15. Ah, or awesome. Cool. Uh, so he was responsible for a lot of the trip, getting everything together, all the logistics and things. Um, and then we also had Chencho who um, was a safety kayaker also. He joined us. He was a, a local Bhutanese chap um, who I believe came on fairly last minute um, just to give us a bit of extra help because um, I had quite recently had shoulder reconstruction just before. So I think Daz was thinking an extra pair of hands on the water wouldn't be a bad thing. And then off the water, um, we had the production crew. Um, and I think in terms of production crew um, in location, um, this was quite a small team, um, but obviously this is a much bigger team than I'm used to going away with on kayaking trips. Um, but we had a producer or director, an assistant producer, a sound specialist, um, and also a cameraman. Um, so so your, your crew is like six people, and then there's like an additional five people essentially traveling with you for all the time you're not kayaking. Yeah, roughly those kind of numbers. Uh, obviously, it can vary a little bit. And we also, for Bhutan, we had a few um, uh, lovely local people that came and helped us um, move some of the gear and just help with general logistics um, and get into the river and things. Um, no, that kind of local knowledge of trying to find um, your, your little tracks and things, trying to find any route down to the river that you can, trying to get in um, as much scouting as possible and also trying to work out where you may camp um, that night um, but yeah I think in terms of television that's a pretty small team but in terms of a kayaking trip that's pretty huge yeah I so think most, pe most that... people who look at those uh, expeditions like that they see on tv like oh it'll be such a great job to like travel around and go kayaking it's not mm. it's not really just travel around and go kayaking there's so many other moving moving parts to your to you going down yeah. the river to capture that what were some of the, the main struggles for dealing with a uh, a crew that I would say is relatively that big, but I guess for TV is relatively small. But what were some of the, the main struggles um, with dealing with all those extra peripherals other than like starting late and finishing late? Yeah, I guess other than the long days and obviously in kayaking, we're all used to kind of getting up and going as soon as possible because you know how precious daylight hours are and you want to minimize the risk of being caught out and being on the river too late and not finding camp in time, that kind of thing. Um, but I guess... The, the main kind of um, hurdle that we had was from the beginning, the team were very keen to try and join us in rafts so that obviously they could capture as much of the action as they could. Um, and obviously you're seeing a lot more of the wildlife and the scenery and things from the river itself. And they were keen to get as much of that as possible on these spectacular pieces of equipment that they had. Obviously, Pringle had some camera gear with him, but he's limited to what he can take on the river with him, what he can t fit in his kayak, as well as all the safety gear that he needs. Um, so the real TV equipment, really, is with the cameraman and the sound guy. Um, and the only way, really, of them to capture that was to join us in rafts. And it was quite clear from the very beginning that this was not a suitable river for rafts. Um, anyone that's seen the program, it's... It's very narrow at parts. Um, Could you describe steep. it for people who haven't seen it? Because yeah. It's yeah. not widely available in North America. Oh, okay. Um, I know that it's been shown in some parts of America. Um, is it? Is the channel called PBS? I think that's what it's called, isn't uh, it? Yep. Yep, I think it was on there. Um, and basically, it's um, a very deep canyon, um, quite um, pool drop in style. There were quite a few like nice boulder gardens and things, but there was also quite a few shelves where it lost a lot of gradient. Um, at times it wasn't easy or even possible at times to scout um, portages were quite the mission um, but in most parts doable there was only really one spot that um, was a big problem for that um, yeah it's just the typical kind of terrain that you won't cover much distance in a day of kayaking um, 
you're spending a lot of your time kind of um, trying to find your way down the river and trying to scout as much as you can from the water or from from the boulders. Um, and that in itself um, just meant that when we're getting off the water after a long day, we we're very kind of physically and mentally tired from the challenges of running a, a canyon that's never been explored before. But um, obviously an incredible adventure. And, and what was your resolution with the raft camera guys in the end? Like, did they, did you manage to make that happen or was it just like, kind of like figure it out? Yeah, so um, they were able to join us on our two training days, which we did on two um, well-known sections of river. So that obviously they could get a little bit of kind of the warm up um, rapids and what we call like shakedown um, days. And then they basically, um, they joined us on the last day of our expedition um because the river did slightly widen uh, and maybe uh, lost a little bit less gradient but it still wasn't ideal um if i remember rightly i think we covered less than a kilometer in a whole day it was pretty epic <laughs> yeah i mean um, that's that's quite the pace yeah <laughs> And you can imagine there was there was some rapids that just weren't suitable for rafts and trying to portage rafts in those kind of environments is not enjoyable work. Um, but there was there were some rapids that were great and they got some amazing footage. Um, it just, yeah, wasn't the, the best kind of um, style of whitewater for rafts, really. All right, so let's let's rewind a little bit before you were a TV personality, before you were like <laughs> going all over the world to do these cool expeditions. How did you start kayaking? Um, well, I started at a well-known whitewater course called Home Pier Pond in Nottingham. Um, I basically just met some... Well, that's a lie, actually. I first went in a kayak in Scouts uh, when I was younger. Um, and that was kind of my introduction to kayaking. And we paddled on some flat lakes and I absolutely loved it um, to the point where I'd be the first one on the water and the last one off. Um, I then didn't get to do it for a while because I didn't realise it was something that you could do out of scout camp. Um, and then uh, when I got a bit older, I, I met some friends who turned out to be kayakers and they invited me along one weekend to home pier pond. Um, shoved me in a duo or a two-man kayak and we just started running the white water course and then the following weekend we did the same but in duckies and rafts um, and then I think I went every weekend that summer basically anytime anyone would take me um, I would be there um, I didn't know how to roll I didn't have any skills but I just loved being in the water um, and then um, I Basically, I got a kayak and eventually learned to roll. It took me a long time to get the hang of it. But as soon as I could roll, I pretty much lived at the whitewater course because no longer needed anyone to look after me. So I could be there basically in any spare time I would spend down there. Um, and then, then I started um, doing trips around Europe. Um, I should say prior to Europe, I was doing a lot more freestyle. I, home pier punt's really good for play boating. Um, so I was really into that. And then I kind of entered the world of river running by going around Europe, particularly Italy, Valsasia, um, Austria, um, and then to Norway. And then I started going a bit further afield um, to places like Asia. Um, and then, yeah, and it just kept building basically. And that's kind of a classic um, progression, I think, for a lot of people where they start taking, take those steps, take those steps, take those steps. But it's interesting to hear, like, you hear so many people just like, oh, I learned to roll really quickly. And I <laughs> think back to when I was learning to roll and thinking it was, t it, it took me a long time to learn to roll and to, and to get figured out. And I think there is an element of, like, grit you have to have, like, learning to kayak, mm. uh, especially in England, especially, like, <laughs> the, the main whitewater season is, like, through the winter, Mm -hmm. um you need to you do need to have a little a little bit of uh grit to to like stick it out for yeah especially because uh, you don't tend to have very good kit when you first start out uh and it's freezing cold and you're usually trying to learn to roll in a cold lake somewhere and uh, i don't so it's I, super this appealing. Eight, I think in the last like five years mm -hmm. i remember learning to kayak and not having 
much gear at all. Like you'd have like a long john wetsuit and a dry top, maybe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like almost no one, almost no one I knew had a dry suit. <laughs> and now it seems like the cost of a dry suit has come down so much mm. that they're way more accessible and it's like much, it's much more comfortable and easier for people to start now. Um, yeah, sure. And I, I remember that like ripping it out and being like, <laughs> if you had a dry suit, you were like, you know, you were like much luckier than some of the other people you were with, you know? Mm, yeah. And I think, yeah, you're, you're right. Like whenever I go kayak, like whenever I see people on the river now, like most people will have dry suits or at least got good like dry tops and maybe dry pants. Um, and that does make a huge difference. I think probably that is playing a big part in numbers of participation in the sport because less people are being put off by the the um the challenging conditions are uh, you in england are you pretty dark are you pretty like thumb on the pulse of like participation would you say um as in my, for my own kayaking or kind of getting involved with yeah, like when, when you see are you, are you like at the whitewater course for example do you see a lot more people there than you did five years ago yeah um obviously um, because of everything that's happening at the moment they're having to kind of limit numbers um but saying that i'm still seeing like even so um loads of people still seem super keen there's loads of people paddling through the winters now um i my favorite river that i spend a lot of time at um over in devon if it's a weekend and there's there's water in the river it's absolutely like thriving with people there the car park is stacked full of vans and cars with boats on their roofs and it's super cool to see actually um you know just seeing that much psych uh, even though it's cold and wet and miserable, just to see that many people there that have turned up and are excited to go paddling is pretty awesome. What do you think is the cause of that? Other than like coronavirus, no one being able to do anything else except outside activities. Um, well, I, I do know that um, water sports as a whole has massively grown this year because um, obviously people can't travel. Um, so they're perhaps having to think about what else they can do in the UK um, that would give them that kind of like um that kind of thrill I guess that they'd usually be getting from going on their holidays they're perhaps looking at things that they can do with their families what they can take their kids to go do um so uh, maybe some of them are taking on coaching or um joining clubs and things which is really cool um and I think for a lot of people that were already paddling um it's been it's been a weird year as, as you know um a lot of Brits would normally be going to places um, like all over Europe through the summer, Norway in particular. I know I was meant to be in Norway for a good chunk of the summer. Um, and obviously no one's been allowed to do that. And it wasn't until recently that the white water course has reopened. Um, so for a lot of us, we're all kind of paddling on the flat water, trying to keep our paddle fitness up. Um, if there was water in the rivers, then that was great. But obviously with it being summer, it wasn't super consistent. Um, but we were pretty lucky. I know Wales in particular had a lot of good storms. So I think for as far as summers go, we were really lucky this year. Um, but a lot of people didn't get to paddle as much as they usually would. So I think now that we're coming into the autumn or the fall um, and everywhere's getting pretty wet, you can just like see how psyched everyone is and everyone's just ready for it. It's like everyone's been sitting waiting to go paddling and now it's starting to happen, which is really cool. So something I think about pretty often um, that maybe is changing now thanks to coronavirus, but like I'm always concerned that participation numbers in kayaking are not um, as high as they were like 15 years ago. And I'm I'm always looking for things like what can I do or what can people like you, you and I do um, to help more people be interested in, in checking out whitewater kayaking. Do you think, can you think of anything in particular uh, that you have done or that you're trying to do um, that is getting more people hyped on it? Yeah, I think I think you're right with that. And, um, and, and partly the programs that we've been doing with Steve, I think will help because um, this is a second series now and both of them have included a really cool, impressive piece of whitewater um, and I think sold the sport pretty well, um, particularly this most recent expedition um and I think just kind of like maybe like showcasing kayaking and actually showing how amazing this sport is and all the cool places it can take you to um and kind of getting involved with more younger people uh, maybe 
um, giving them the opportunity to try the sport and see if they like it and give them that chance to get involved and to take it up. Um, I'm doing a bit of work with um, some groups of younger younger people. I'm getting back involved with the scouts again um, and taking them on some kayaking trips. Uh, and that's just really cool to like share the psych and hopefully um, make some new awesome little paddlers. And hopefully their friends will become awesome little paddlers too. Um, and kayaking will just keep growing. What? Um, okay, that's good. That's good. Some good things to think about there. And I hope... Um... I hope some good takeaways that people can think about how they showcase kayaking and their kayaking adventures to others. I think especially with like Instagram and uh, YouTube and Facebook mm-hmm. right now, it's it's easy to post those carnage reels, but yeah. I don't think <laughs> the carnage reels are helping the greater good. You know, I don't think that people want to see you getting absolutely pitted in a hole and then taking yeah. a really bad swim. Like I, yeah. I don't, I don't think that's the future of, of getting people involved in kayaking. No, um, I think that just makes it look uh, kind of unappealing and maybe scary. Um, and I, I just don't think it's showing, like, the best parts of kayaking. Like, yeah, it can be a good laugh sometimes, like, having a little bit of a beater. But, like, really all the best parts of the sport, you, you don't really think about the beatering as the best thing. Yeah, there's no <laughs> there's no better feeling than just, like, just lacing a tight, like, a, a hard line and making it look really smooth and easy. Yeah. Like, there's no... For me, at least, there's like that's one of the best feelings. Like when you sit, look back, and you're like, "Yep, I could not have done that line any more smoothly yeah. than I just did." Like that is hard to replicate, and maybe it's hard to communicate that visually. That like the amount of like skill and focus you have to put in to get to that place is, um, it takes work, right? Like that's not, yeah, for sure, that's not Definitely. easy. But I think you touched on a really important thing there of like showcasing the sport um at its best and trying to get that's a, a great way to get more people kind of interested and hopefully involved um in what we're doing something that you are probably uniquely qualified to talk to me about because i'm a man i don't know <laughs> but i want to talk about women in kayaking a little bit and obviously there's a lot more men than women mm-hmm. what do you think like you know you kind of mentioned early on that you have a high grit level and that you you know you probably would <laughs> st- suck it out a lot more than um some other kind of women peers when you started what do you think we can do now to help kind of increase uh, decrease the the gap between how many men and how many women are involved in the sport or should we Um, even do you care about that yeah this is something I get asked about fairly often um and I guess I've been guilty of not really kind of getting that involved in it uh, which I've become more aware of um but I think the best thing really is just like I was saying, like broadcasting the sport, showing how much of an awesome time you're having doing this incredible sport. Um, and yeah, it's, it's obvious I'm a girl. Um, and yeah, I'm having a great time and showing that like it doesn't matter if you're a guy or a girl. Um, this is open to everyone. Like kayaking is one of few sports which is like super accessible um, to you, no matter if you're old, young, girl, guy what your background is it just doesn't matter like there is some like form of kayaking for you if you want it um and in terms of encouraging more girls like I would be psyched if more girls wanted to come like get into kayaking and I guess it's just kind of making it clear that it doesn't matter what gender you are it makes no difference um if you want to do it then do it um, and maybe like just making sure that there is opportunities for people out there. And um, for me, like I didn't get into kayaking until fairly late, just because I didn't know it was something you could go do. Um, my family is not sporty in the slightest. They're not outdoorsy other than walking the dog. Um, so I just wasn't shown these kind of these things that are going on and that you can get involved in. So I guess just like 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 I keep saying, kind of broadcasting the, the showcasing the sport and giving opportunities for people saying like, hey, like, look at this awesome sport that's going on. Why don't you give it a go? See if you like it. If you do, then do more. Um, and yeah, and just giving people that kind of option and choice and opportunity. So refreshing to hear that the best thing that uh, people can be doing is showcasing because I, I often feel uh, guilty that I'm not doing, well, I'm just wildly underqualified and, and ignorant <laughs> um about helping to encourage more women into kayaking like i just i haven't 
like obviously I'm aware that it's um more one sided, but I I've been uh ignorant. I just haven't tried. I'm almost willfully ignorant. Like I haven't tried to look into ways that to change my behavior into getting more women as well as just more people generally. Like my goal is always more people generally. But yeah, um, I think as well I, like just making sure we're not doing anything or saying anything that would put um like if we're being kind of gender specific here if, as long as we're not doing or saying stuff that would put girls off um trying it um but i think that it should be like a general rule anyway like we shouldn't be trying to put anyone off and be encouraging to everyone if they want to get involved and i think like i think we're getting way better because i know when i first started kayaking there wasn't a huge amount of choice in small creek boats or river boats um, and you kind of just pick the best one that was right for you out of a really small selection. Whereas now there seems loads I of I think choice. when you and I used to paddle together, it was just like small burn or nothing. Like yeah. that, was a, <laughs> that was a good choice. It was like the only small creek boat you could buy was small yeah. piranha burn. Okay, it's, it's this or not kayaking. Like what, what yeah. do you want? Yeah, whereas now um, there is so much choice of boats. And I think that's really cool. Um, and... I really enjoy kind of swapping between my Ripper and my 9R2. Um, and I love both boats, particularly the Ripper. I've been having a lot of fun in that and just starting to get into the Ozone. Um, and it's really cool that there's just all these boats on, on offer now. Um, and I think that will do loads for progression as well. Having a boat that is the right size for you and is still a really good river boat. Um, so I think I think um, I, I think that kind of there. that kind of builds into like not putting people off to like what, what like what we were saying about having that cold weather gear so you don't have to grid it out as much yeah. like yeah. having a boat that's the right size for you so you don't have to grid it out as much in a boat that's like just wildly not fitting you yeah. and, it's, and it's holding back your progress and people don't always identify especially early on, the wrong size boat and how yeah. much how quickly you can improve if you're stacking the deck in your favor with like the right size paddle, the right size boat, the right equipment for the conditions you're in. Like if you can get that trifecta of things like kind of lined up and it's something I talk about a lot, like paddle size is something I see all the time of people just like really struggling. I'm like, man, if you had a longer paddle, you'd be having a much easier time. Yeah, right yeah. They're just not, people are just not aware that yeah. the small changes in, in equipment that they can make. And it's like, uh, if you'd spend an extra hundred bucks and got like a better paddle, like you, you would be having a much more fun time right now. Yeah, be a proper game changer. And um, yeah, and I've paddled boats that are too big for me or just not outfitted well, and it just feels like you're fighting the whole time. Um, and yeah, not as endurable as it could be. Um, so for people, and, for people who don't know you, you're like a, a fairly small girl. Are there? Any yeah, other I'm pretty, <laughs> pretty small. Add to boats like regardless that help them fit better because like, i'm lucky to be a medium like pretty much down the line medium sized man and yeah. i usually just take boats like right out of the packaging i'm like okay put some hip foam in off you go oh uh, um, you lucky thing <laughs> I, and i i know that i'm in a lucky position is there any like outfitting hacks or modifications that you just like always know you're gonna have to make yeah that's yeah make your life better so it's super boring but every time I get a new boat, I probably spend like four hours outfitting it and I hate it, but it makes such a big difference that Talk I... Talk us through. This is going to be important for okay. someone right now. <laughs> Tell us every single step you do in those four hours. Okay, girl. so as soon as Take I get your my time. new kayak... Don't, don't hold anything back. <laughs> this is going to save someone's life. Yeah. Okay, so first things first, when I order a new kayak, um, it's a piranha because I paddle piranhas, but I also um, always get them to send the uh, piranha hookers that come with them, uh, which are basically extensions of the thigh grips. I really like my thighs to feel kind of hooked to the boat. Um, I think it's probably a small person thing, but I use my legs loads when I kayak. Um, so if they're well connected to the boat, then it's just going to respond so much better to when I'm trying to make it do certain things or go certain directions. Um, the footrest uh, comes probably just one off the closest that it will go. Um, also the foam pad in front of that, uh, partly for the leg length, but also um, just to reduce that risk of um, getting your, your shoes trapped or your toes trapped um, if it's only the metal footrest. Um, the seat I tend to actually leave in the middle, which some people think is a bit strange, um, but I just find that um, if I move the seat forwards, it affects um, when I go to lift the nose up. 
say if I'm doing like a flare or a booth, um, I found that if I move the seat forwards, the nose um, just doesn't lift so well. It's a bit too much weight there. I, I in just, the front. like last week, I made a video about this and I was like, I don't oh, know what cool. to do. the seat is the first thing, not the last thing. Like the seat ah. should be the last thing you move. Like you should have paddled your boat for like four to six hours before you think about <laughs> moving the seat. And people were like, get out of the packet and then move the seat immediately. I'm like, oh. yeah. Yeah, I think I um, I didn't start playing around with the seat until fairly recently, maybe only last year, because I knew that it was like a massive ball like to try and move. But then I did start playing around with it a lot um, over the winter. Um, and I actually, after loads of faff of moving it forwards and getting it back again and things, I actually decided that it was better for me in the middle there. Um, and yeah, and then... Um, the the thigh braces the ratchets and stuff I all I just move everything so that um everything's quite close to me and I just feel really well connected to the boat that way it's just going to respond to me way better um I won't feel like I'm fighting it um and yeah it just works with me rather than like against me do so. you have to add anything onto the back band or the back of the seat or are you about right um uh, the back band no I do tighten it up um just so that it's nice and snug underneath the seat I tend to have um, it does vary a little bit for the kayak but I probably tend to have like three seat pads maybe four um, so I just I heighten it a bit just so that it doesn't feel like I'm in a bathtub and I'm roughly not how much bathtub. higher are you sitting like um, that's probably like oh I'm not very good with measurements um, maybe it's like how many fingers three, maybe mm, maybe like two and a half fingers Okay, so you're talking about like probably an inch, an inch and a half of yeah. Like, size. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's significant. That's a big, that's a big yeah. lift. And I think yeah, it's pretty big. And but I might play around with that if it doesn't feel right. I might re remove one. I might cut one in half. Like, um, I that first day I'm kind of on dry land, uh, making all the kind of adjustments. And then that afternoon I'll take it out on the water. And if something doesn't feel right, I'll just adapt it. Um, boats tend to be slightly different. Um, so I just play around with it, but I know roughly what works for me. And then as necessary, I can make little changes here and there. Um, but yeah, I just feel, I like to feel super connected. Um, and that just seems to work really well with me. Yeah. I think being, being tight is so, is so key, but it's interesting. Mm. Uh, I know that, uh, I'm not meant to tell you this. I know that Jackson <laughs> Kayak is working on like a similar, like thigh grip, like extra hook system. Yeah. Like the um, which I, th I think is going to be announced sometime towards the end of this year, which is yeah. going to be exciting because I think a lot of people in that same position, they like that extra, that extra hook in feeling. Yeah. If they can get it. Um, something which some of the, especially like Clay Wright, some of the like older generation paddlers do quite a lot is build like foam wedges that go under your knees and push your knees like kind of into the thigh grip. Do you also okay. pursue something like that or not? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I say I just have the like extensions because, uh, like you're saying about Jackson, before Piranha, I was um, paddling Waka, um, and I was used to their thigh grips that you could adjust so that they kind of came all the round, way around your thigh, um, which some people aren't keen on. They feel a bit trapped in the kayak. They're a bit worried that maybe they wouldn't be able to get out so well if they needed to to swim. Um, but I've got quite used to that position, um, so I I don't feel super well connected if I, it's not coming around with my thigh like that so hence I really like to have the hookers on my kayaks um, but yeah I don't tend to put any extra foam around that area at all I find that um, if everything's set up right and with the hookers um, I feel that's enough for me and that that works pretty well all right that's I'm sure somebody is gonna be listening to this and be like this was all <laughs> the information I needed that no one else was telling me so I think it's important and that everyone we else will be thinking boring outfitting chat <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, like, how tall are you? Uh, like five, two or three. Yeah, so I think there's probably like there's someone listening to this who's also five two or five three, yeah. and if not, then I hope that um whoever maybe someone else is listening, they're like, oh, I know someone who's five two or five three and has a tough time outfitting yeah. kayak. They'll maybe just pass it on. They can skip ahead yeah. to this a little bit, and then they'll have the the rundown. You yeah, know? and I've had quite a few paddlers, like smaller paddlers, say to me, like, um, these boats, they never fit and they're still too big and stuff. But then when I get chatting to them, they've kind of just, like you said earlier, they've just kind of taken it out the the packaging and just got straight in it onto the water. And 
it's not right for them but kind of every kayak you need to adapt to yourself and make specific to you yeah i couldn't i couldn't agree with that more speaking of people asking you questions and things Mm -hmm. now that you're basically a famous tv celebrity (laughs) do you feel like you have to act differently like when you're kayaking or do you feel like pretty much the same um i think i feel pretty much the same um yeah i i I don't feel like i've changed anything i i think people have always think that thought that i'm a bit mental and a bit crazy um great (laughs) yeah i like a bit of suffering um i like a challenge i I like something to work towards Uh, i'm not afraid to kind of get up in the middle of the night to go drive a few hours if the river might be in and stuff like um i think it's just the the keen paddlers in the uk are used to working hard for it because it's not always super easy to get out onto the rivers here. We don't have consistent levels and things. So you have to be, you have to be really flexible. Um, and yeah, your priority has to be kind of put on going wherever the water is and doing what you need to do to be there. And before yeah, that's kind out. of one of the best lessons I took away from my time uh, when I was paddling in England a lot was like, if it's, if it's going, you've just got to go. Yeah, uh, sure. to Take that mentality <laughs> into not just into kayaking other places, but if you can take that mentality into the rest of other mm-hmm. aspects of your life, I think that's really powerful. I think you, yeah. can get, you can get a big boost on a lot of stuff you do if you yeah. just take that, if you take that mentality, but then apply it to your work or apply it to your whatever, like yeah. you can go so much further. Yeah. And it makes you super appreciative as well. Cause obviously since um, kind of learning in the UK, I've done a lot of my paddling over in South America where you've got, a, a, an array of options for that day of where you want to paddle like each day you can make the decision on which of several rivers are running that day and which one would you like to run the most and that's a really cool um like situation to be in and I'm still really su- like appreciative of that um and I, yeah I think we just don't take it for granted so much because we're used to it not being quite so convenient as that so speaking of having to change or having to act differently before we started we were kind of talking about uh other things we want to talk about and we chatted a little bit about things you're trying to do um to improve um kind of give give back a little bit as, or give back as much as you can uh in terms of the environment in terms of paddling community and stuff um what's what are you doing on that front to give back like now now that you're now that you've reached this point where you're like getting to go on these cool trips and like kind of, you know, all your hard, all your hard work and grit over the years has paid off. Uh, what are you tr- doing now to give back to the kind of future generations of kayakers? Yeah. So I think everyone is becoming more aware now of the impacts that we are having um, on our planet, basically, and kind of we're destroying it um, collectively. And I think we're all becoming aware of that. Uh, particularly more recently with David Attenborough's um, program that's been on um, and just more and more media covering what's happening in the world. Um, And I think personally, um, something that's opened my eyes to it a lot more is um, obviously the traveling in general and seeing all these places, some of them beautiful, some of them um, not quite what they used to be. And we're seeing kind of species um, disappearing, Um, but also For me, obviously, I've done a few of my trips now with Steve, um, who's obviously an expert when it comes to wildlife and our environment. And he um, has educated me a lot regarding this and kind of opened my eyes up to a lot of what is going on. Um, I've been fortunate to visit places like Bhutan, which um, in particular is an amazing country and setting such a good example for the rest of the world. Um, It's the only carbon negative country in the world um meaning that they take more greenhouse gases from the atmosphere than they actually produce um and they've made commitments such as um keeping at least 60% of their country forested um and being able to visit some places like this um uh, really makes you see kind of the, the people that are trying hard to make changes um and i have become very aware of this and i am become more aware that I have gained a lot from our outdoors. Um, I've had some of the best times of my life because I've been fortunate enough to travel and to kayak all over the world. Um, And now I'm becoming more aware that I should be giving something back, Um, something 
to our amazing outdoor adventure playground. Um, now it needs us and we need to be doing more. So what uh, specific actions are you taking? Um, so I don't claim to be an expert at all. I'm very much still learning. Um, and I'm speaking to friends and kind of people I've met um, over the last few months who are more knowledgeable in these areas and trying to work with them on kind of plans and projects and bits I can get involved in. Um, last year, I teamed up with the Wildland Trust, which is a rainforest conservation charity. Um, and I did um, two tours of talks, probably about 20 talks in total. And all the profits um, went to um, protecting rainforests um, in South America. And yeah, and I'm still working on some projects for the next few months. Um, but essentially, I think one of the best things we can do is try and kind of encourage anyone that's enjoying the outdoors to be doing something back for it as well so that we're not just taking we're giving back as well um, and the more that we can encourage this and change some of our our habits and our routines and just become more aware of our impacts I think the better um, and in some ways getting more people into the outdoors and into adventure into kayaking will make even more people aware of um, what's happening in the world and how we can help. Uh, so just and kind of spreading the love of the outdoors. <laughs> so kind of to, just to summarize here for mm. people who um, maybe like have to step out for a second or something, mm -hmm. um, would it be fair to summarize what you said as get educated about how you can, ways you can give back and then look for ways you can collaborate with existing organizations um, in, in the environmental field? Yeah, and I think a lot of our brands now are becoming way more aware. And I've started trying to work with, um, with brands that are trying to do more. Uh, Jewelstone, for instance, um, they've got loads of cool projects going on. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, uh, pretty hopeful. I'm going to get Rory on here soon to talk about um, oh, yeah, their 1% was... for the planet thing. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah and they've got loads going on uh, with like coral protection and plantation of trees and things. Um, so working with those guys. Um, paddle sports companies such as um, Peak and Piranha, they're getting um, a lot more into kind of using recyclable um, produce. So things that would have been waste are actually becoming kind of our dry tops and kayaks and things. Um, and yeah, just investing your money, buying your products and things from the companies that are trying to make changes and do things right. Um, and just maybe stepping back and thinking about some of the stuff we're doing on a daily basis and what kind of impact is having what we could do to have less impact or a better impact um and just even if you just start tiny and build up i think if we all do that then we'll start to see change i think that's some good some good stuff for people to chew on um the last thing i had on my talk about list here my my cheat sheet um was injuries and you kind of mentioned in passing that right before you went to bhutan you had a significant shoulder injury um do you want to talk us through what you had what happened to you and how you got back to be back to health in time to go to on a big trip yeah um this was a pretty significant chunk of my life uh because the same week that i had been told that i needed shoulder reconstruction was the same week that I had got the phone call inviting me on this amazing, epic expedition uh, for BBC, world first, and just going to be incredible, um, which obviously I took. Um, wasn't completely honest about the surgery, but just couldn't turn it down. Um, but essentially, I had um, been in Chile that winter, and I was trying to learn to ear dip on the Pauguin. Um and my first attempt of it, attempt of it didn't go very well um, and I ended up doing a pretty nasty injury to my shoulder um, and being the silly person that I am I then continued to paddle for a month on the footer um, not wanting to give up the opportunity to go paddle this amazing so what, what was that what water. was that initial injury you did there like hyperextension like yeah bad so it, pain, like, it, what are we talking about yeah, at the time, I wasn't sure exactly what I'd done. I just assumed it had been some kind of like strain of my rotator cuff. Um, but essentially, I'd gone to do an ear dip um, and just completely messed it up, really, and um, put a load of pressure on my shoulder at a really bad angle. Um, and just 
yeah, um, just kind of wrenched it out of place, I think, a bit like a subluxation. So it went out and then came back in again. Um, when I got back to the UK and had all the scans done, um, it became apparent that I'd torn through two of my rotator, rotator cuffs, uh, so the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, um, which are pretty significant parts of the shoulder joint uh, and its kind of support structure. Um, I'd also torn the labrum, which is the ring of cartilage on the inside of your shoulder joint. Um, so it was pretty much just hanging on. Um, so I needed to have reconstruction, have the cartilage sewn back on, the two muscles um, repaired, and then they did what they call a subacromial decompression, where they kind of carve away all the bones and anything that's kind of broken and in the way of the joint, um, just to give it the best chance of healing and getting back to as close a recovery as possible, really. Um, so it was a pretty intense part of my life, kind of going for surgery and having to speed up the rehab process a lot compared to what it would have done would have been and in what, normal what, what when you say speed up the reset um, there's like people out there listening i'm sure with a shoulder injury right now who are like yeah tell me more about this speeding up of the, re the rehab <laughs> process uh what what did you do to speed it up would you um, if you had your well, time over would you if you hadn't had to go on that trip would you have done it that way um i i think i i i perhaps wouldn't have done it this way but I'm glad that I did. Um, but essentially, I, I worked on one of my strongest skills, which is being annoying. And I found out the personal extension number for the secretary of my surgeon. And I just started ringing her maybe four or five times a day, asking for cancellations until she gave in and was fed up of me that she finally gave me a um, appointment, which was much, it was like a month earlier than what she had originally put me down for. So grit. that played a huge, that was basically the game changer. That's like if, grit. That's like kayaking grit in real life. <laughs> yeah. In a, in another picture. yeah, that poor woman. <laughs> um, and then I, I, I used that skill again after the surgery. Uh, my physio, basically, um, he ended up seeing me most days um, to the point where he'd be sat on his lunch break eating his sandwich. Um, watching me do my exercises I was in the hydro pool twice a day um yeah I I just worked super hard the first six weeks I wasn't allowed out the sling so I did everything I could um to kind of try and keep myself as strong and fit as I could so sitting on a turbo trainer um I wasn't really allowed to run because uh, of the kind of the um the movement on the shoulder but I would try and do strengthening work on my other side, on my core, on my legs, um, and just do everything I could in the meantime. And then as soon as I got the go ahead uh, to take the sling off, um, I worked really hard to try and get as strong as, as soon as possible um, and get out on the water as soon as possible. Um, interestingly enough, um, even just before the um, expedition, and I'd only been allowed on the water for a couple of weeks beforehand, um, at that point, I was doing everything. I was in the white water, I was rolling, um, I was surfing, I was even doing a bit of freestyle. The thing that I couldn't do until the day before we left for the expedition was get my spray deck on, uh, which was a pretty big worry for me, obviously. <laughs> um, not only because it's quite a detrimental part to kayaking, uh, it was Some also... people say it's critical like, yeah. uh, in an expedition setting. <laughs> yeah. um, but also, I, the rest of the team perhaps didn't know the extent of my injury. And I, I didn't want to turn up there looking kind of unprepared or like I couldn't do my job properly. Um, and that I was going to be kind of the weak link of the group. Um, I didn't want that. And I didn't want to give that impression from the very get-go. Um, so... Yeah, I, I just kept working on it. I had therabands that I'd sit on the living room floor as if I was in a kayak and would practice the motion of putting on a spray deck. And luckily, the day before we went, I, I got it. So that worked out pretty well. But yeah, that was the last thing to come. <laughs> Definitely a high uh, high level of grit there involved in <laughs> uh, in speeding up your recovery process. Would you would you recommend it to someone listening now who is like currently in the shoulder rehab world um well my other line of work is physiotherapy so technically um i would have to tell people that that is too rushed and that you should take it much slower uh, which lots of people were telling me at the time because they didn't know i had an expedition coming up um for one i'd been told to kind of keep it a bit on the down low 
but also I was terrified that I wouldn't be ready in time so I didn't kind of want to tell everyone about it in case it didn't work out um and I wouldn't be able to go but um yeah I think I'd probably tell people to take it a little bit slower um but saying that it did absolutely great once we were there there was so much going on and you're so busy that I I hardly even thought about my shoulder I'd like for hours at a time would even forget anything was wrong with it um and then after that expedition I was only home for a couple of days before I left to do a season in Chile um so it did really well there was only once in Chile that I gave it a small tweak and had to have a couple of days off but other than that I, it was doing great I was back doing waterfalls I was on big water and yeah I've been really lucky with it um, but you definitely have to put the time in to to get it back to paddling again it won't just won't just fix itself unfortunately you need to do the the very specific uh, strengthening particularly of the rotator cuff if yeah I always think that the people underestimate how long it's going to take to come back from from an injury even like a non-serious like even if you twist your ankle a little bit that is going to have an impact on you like weeks and months down the line yeah. if you don't do anything about it and the, the harder you work at getting better doesn't always equal the quicker you're going to come no. back you know like and, i'm the absolute worst for it <laughs> yeah I can, even like here in even it's it's like romantic almost to think about like well i just badgered my physiotherapist until i could <laughs> see him every day but yeah. it's like even if you like realistically even if you saw a physiotherapist every single day that would not necessarily guarantee that your recovery is exponentially quicker no no unfortunately um particularly soft tissues in order to recover and get stronger they also need that that kind of rest period as well because as as you'll know when we exercise or when we do any kind of strength training or whatever we're actually breaking down fibers and then they build themselves back up bigger and stronger but if we don't allow them that rest time, that recovery time, they're not able to repair themselves and we, we just keep breaking them down. So theoretically, I know this stuff, but I'm just like most of the paddlers, I think that um, we're just really impatient and we love kayaking. And yeah, we're not too keen on sitting on the banks, watching our mates go kayaking. Um, but yeah. It's, since, uh... <laughs> since like that injury and like after that trip, have you started having a more like, focused off-season training program i know you're like even when we used to like paddle a bit like back in the day you were always like pretty in shape like what do you have like a focused season where you're like trying to be more in shape so you're ready to paddle for like paddling season yeah um i'd say that the last couple of years there's not been a very clear cut season and off season um because i've kind of kind of paddle year round but there might be times um where there's less paddling um than others so it's not really an, a full off season but maybe there's less going on like for instance this summer the river would come in sometimes but not that consistently um so I've always been really into kind of running and swimming I like doing a bit of weight stuff um I've this summer been doing quite a few kind of hit sessions I did some fun little exercise videos and things uh, just there was a few people asking what kind of uh workouts they could be doing at home because at one point we weren't really um, allowed into the outdoors um, with all the restrictions so I was kind of making some fun little hit sessions and um, kind of sharing a little bit of what I get up to um, but yeah I think it's one of those things that again probably because in the UK we can't always go kayaking um, and even in the winter when we think of that as our kayaking season it's still not that consistent you still can't rely on being able to go kayaking every week um so I think we get quite used to having to be adaptive and be flexible and for me particularly probably because um being quite small and a lot of my friends the way that kayaking is it's a lot of guys uh, you end up paddling with big guys who are bigger and stronger than you a lot of the time and I didn't want to like before I didn't want to be the weak link I didn't want to be the liability I didn't want to be the one that's having to be looked after and helped um I wanted to be a core member of the team and the way to do that was to be as fit and as strong as I could be. Um, not only so I could look out for myself and do everything independently, but also so I could look out for my team. Um, if a friend got into trouble, I wanted to know that I'd be strong enough to help them. Um, and yeah, so I think I've always tried to keep quite fit and quite strong. And I enjoy it. It's, as you know, it's like super good for your mental health and your well-being. Um, and 
yeah, I don't know what I'd do if I didn't exercise. I'd have a lot of spare time. <laughs> yeah, I've been really into uh, or really getting more into lifting weights a little bit more this year. Mm. It's like so satisfying. Like lifting up something really heavy is so <laughs> it like really appealed to like a deeper inner part of myself. I didn't realize it was there, but you're like, I didn't even lift this thing very high up and I'm really satisfied about it. <laughs> and I, I wish more people would be, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm interested to think because I don't really, well, I, until this year, I haven't had like a clearly defined off season, mm. but with the prospect of like a more clearly defined off season on the horizon here, it's like, okay, what, what should I be doing now to set myself up for 2021? And I think not, it's kayaking so like in the moment sometimes mm, and so yeah. like day to day that you don't always think like okay what should i be doing for the next eight to 16 weeks or 24 weeks that's yeah. going to get me set up for like spring 2021 like how how can i be best put forward going into that season you know? I think um, uh, like over the, the lockdown period as well, I wrote a few articles for Kayak Session, which were really closely linked to this subject. And I think kind of writing yourself a program of kind of what it is you want to achieve and how you're going to achieve it and then setting yourself a schedule um, that you're likely to keep to and you're kind of you're setting those goals that you're always looking ahead to and making sure that you're working towards them and ticking them off as you go just to keep yourself motivated um but I think the core things really if if you're not able to get on the water or at least not onto white water are going to be your overall strength like you're saying either weights work or body body weight stuff if you've not got any gear at home um plenty of core work so that's something like we always jabber on about, but it's actually really um, useful for protecting our shoulders and our, our hips and our knees and things is having that strong core and that strong base. And it will just take a lot of the strain off other areas, um, particularly your spine and things. Um, and then your fitness. Uh, kayaking is obviously it's quite a specific type of fitness to be paddle fit. But even things like scouting, portaging, walking into rivers, it's all going to um challenge you and be quite demanding so for instance if you've got a, a bit of a hike into the river you don't want to do that and then arrive at the river absolutely worn out and then you have to get on and run those rapids and you're yeah, already in, exhausted in previous years i've been so guilty of being like <laughs> spent the whole year on the ottawa like you know four steps from the car to the water four yeah. steps back to the car <laughs> and then you go on a trip if like you know day one you're like yeah oh my God, I'm so <laughs> And, and all of a sudden, the kayaking is a lot harder if you're turning up exhausted already. Yeah, so. it's just like a lot of, you know, it, it, and it's the same. I imagine it's the same at every level, wherever you're at. Like, I'm, you know, trying to do my best. And you show up Ooh. and you're like, oh, my God, I'm gassed for like the first 10 days. <laughs> and, you know, if you're only on a three week trip, like, yeah. You know, that's the thing like setting yourself up as well as you can to get the most out of your time as you say if you're just there on that trip for a short amount of time you want to know that you're going to get the most out of that time and not compromise on being tired and unfit and things um and yeah and using what you've got like in the uk we don't always have ridden white water so getting out on the the flat water doing as much flat water paddling as you can or if that's not an option um getting out swimming I've done a load of swimming the most swimming I've ever done uh, this summer and I've actually really enjoyed it um and it's it's kept me fairly sane I think whilst we've not been able to go kayaking and uh, so yeah I think just being adaptive and finding ways to um set yourself up as well as you can well, so I don't really have anything else to talk with you about, um, I think, unless you've got anything else you want to bring up or any other good uh, inspiring injury stories you want to talk about. Um, uh, no, no, I don't think so. I think I've probably babbled uh, quite a bit at you. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I'm sure there's going to be some useful takeaways from this for people who are listening in terms of uh, like outfitting and in terms of things you can do to give back and ways to increase participation and be a yeah, be a good role model for other people getting into the sport and kind of trying to showcase it as best we can. Um, I know it's something I think about all the time, but I, I wish more people were thinking about it, like, you know, what you're doing to showcase um, the thing that we all enjoy so much and, and what we can do to give back to those people, uh, to, to get new people in and to give back to the, the next generation of people coming through here. Uh, I think it's really important and I, I hope it's, I hope it's something more people are thinking about, you know, like, yeah. well, it's good for the hives, good for the bees. So 
Yeah, and I think like we're all just starting, to, well, I am anyway, starting to realise how much I get out of kayaking. Uh, this year it's kind of been taken away from us a bit and that's really highlighted to me how much of a huge part of my life it is and how much I've gained from it. Um, and yeah, and kind of making me realise that I should be giving something back and not just not just taking all the time. So hopefully other people are thinking the same and, and we can all start doing some awesome stuff and uh, preserving what we've got. Fingers crossed. Sal, if people want to follow you on the social channels, how can they find you? Um, I've got Instagram. It's sal.montgomery. Uh, or on Facebook, Sal Montgomery. And I have a YouTube ta- channel, uh, also Sal Montgomery. Uh, and that's where you'll find quite a few of my kayaking videos or workout ideas or just some general chit-chat, really. Um, but, yeah, yeah, it'd be awesome to hear from you guys if you've got any questions at all. Nice. Well, this has been Sal Montgomery and Seth Ashworth. Questions, every thought to ask the Whitewater Kayaking Podcast. We will see you in a future episode. Peace. Thank you. Bye.